Good evening and welcome to Tottenham Tantrum Gold Special. Tonight we have a legend that is Tottenham's record appearance holder, two times FA Cup winner, two times UEFA Cup winner, two times League Cup winner. He is a legend of the team, he is a legend of Spurs, he is the one, he is the only, Steve Perriman. So, good evening Steve and welcome to TTG. Good evening. Really, really proud and honoured to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm more than happy to be here. Now, absolutely delighted to have you here with us tonight. Also with us is my usual co-hosts, Coover and Phil and Ben. Um, I mean, Steve, I mean, you've had a glorious career at Tottenham. Um, absolutely fantastic. You've won everything in the game. Um, you also got a book out at the moment. So do you want to speak a little bit about that? And what it's about and where people can get it uh yeah thank you um i suppose if you have 19 years at a club one club um although i did to go to various clubs afterwards um i think 19 years was the bulk of my career so i joined as a boy 15 years of age i grew up at tottenham um i grew up under the leadership of people like bill nicholson and keith birkinshaw and we had some very, very good times. Uh, we had some very bad times as well. Relegation, you can't forget that. So um, I was part of all this. I played with some magnificent players. I traveled the world. I had a very privileged um, career playing for Spurs. It wasn't like I was changing cities, moving from club to club to club and moving my family around. So uh, I think if anyone um, has shown loyalty to Tottenham, I would never put myself above Bill Nicholson because you, you absolutely could not. But um, I think my book just portrays that loyalty, my feeling for the club, for the supporters and, um, and for my teammate. And I, th I think I was saying earlier that my strength was that I could lead. Uh, as a captain and that wasn't from day one because I just joined as a player and but eventually my sort of character took over as, as a leader and um, but I sort of knew where I sat in the in the in the group and uh, yeah so I I didn't get above myself I didn't get below myself I knew how to pick myself with the crowd with the with the board well the board really were out the way they you didn't know them um but with the manager i i i helped i knew what was going to make me selectable and uh you know that was from the age of 17 when i got in the first team because all, all that other stuff you do before then is sort of preparing yourself to handle the moment when you get in and um and i was lucky with injuries um but it can't all be luck um i understood my own body i listened to my body i respected my body i respected the opinions that i was given if a physiotherapist said to me for instance you won't make that any worse if you play then i trust him and play maybe if i'd been in the depths of the leagues and, and trusted such a, a an opinion it wouldn't be quite as good as it was unless it was at tottenham so um so i was consistent i was honest and i could lead and uh i think that's what happens that's sort of how you miss the cull at the end of every year and i yeah that that's what happens that's the the the, the, the squad is cut and cut and cut but um i i staved that off for a number of years and um it's a club that i did not know before i joined it i was i'm from west london so it's sort of a bit of a different story. I'm sure that you're all indoctrinated with Spurs, and I can understand that, having been through it. Um, but it wasn't a family thing or anything like that. Of course, I knew about Bill Nicholson. Of course, I knew about the double team and the wonderful achievements and Jimmy Greaves and Pat Jennings and Mike England. So all of a sudden, from being an apprentice and cleaning their boots, I'm all of a sudden alongside them, playing. And now they're trusting me. So 
you can imagine how that makes you feel. And uh, so basically, my book is a story about all of that. And then when I leave Spurs, you go and live another life. You start to see what the other side of football is like. And then you go into coaching and management. Ended up in Japan, which was an amazing, amazing experience. And um, one that I'll never, ever forget or, or disrespect. It was wonderful. So um, now I'm, I'm thankfully retired. I don't watch so much football these days. But, uh, of course, I have an opinion on what's going on. Um, but, but sort of really happy that my football life was in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, a bit of management in the, in the years up to now. But um, in, in a way, I'm, I'm 70 years of old, at age of, I'm 70 years old and delighted with what I gave to it. I think I was a serious football player and um, always treated, try to treat everyone with respect, be it supporters or coaches or managers whatever. I didn't believe in running for that manager because I like him, but I'm not running for you because I don't like you. I've, I don't quite know where that's coming from as per disrespect of the crowd and the people that are paying the money to watch you play. But um, but yeah, it's an interesting book. I, of course, I'm convinced of it because I did it, but I um, had a lot of help. And um, so the book is called A Spur Forever. Um, it's available through the publishers. Um, and I suppose it's also available through Steve Perriman Public at gmail.com. So um, if you haven't read it, I suggest you do, even if you borrow it from someone else. Um, it's a, a particular book that because my brother, oldest brother, was such a clever man, he wasn't a coach, he wasn't a teacher, but he was very clever. And just to describe one moment of that, um, he takes me on the bus to play for my junior school on Ealing Common. And I know that I played for Ealing District eventually, but Ealing Common was about half an hour bus ride from my home. So I'm 10, my brother's 14. We're on a bus, get there on Ealing Common, playing against the rival school. And all of a sudden, my brother Ted sees in the on the common there amongst the trees sees his geography teacher so he goes over hello mr so and so hello Perryman. what are you doing here i'm watching my brother play this is his first ever game in kit his first ever game for the school team in kit you've got a camera on you would you mind coming and taking a picture so i have the picture of that for instance for the book i mean of course, he doesn't know then that I'm going to be a player, but it's still an important occasion when you play your first game in kit. So the stuff that he kept, that I'd have to be honest, I wouldn't have kept. And therefore, the, the book goes through the eras. I, I'm not a great book reader, actually. I, I say that because I, I say that if I try and read a book, my legs ache. <laughs> which is a sort of bad excuse, but I'm telling you that that is the truth. So um, it's a book made up with text and photographs. And for instance, the, the letter that Bill Nix sent my father telling him how much he wanted me to sign for Spurs. Mr. Tottenham asking the father of a 15 year old boy that they wanted to sign, how much he wanted to sign him and how, how they would, never have been more pleased to sign a young player and yeah. i mean that that's a piece of history so all that stuff is in the book and if you're a Spurs supporter you i guarantee you will love it if you're an, I, arsenal, if you're an arsenal supporter you'll respect it and I, I see on the book it says forwarded by glenn hoddle so yet another great pass from the great man hoddle yes well i've always got on well with glenn i um i sort of took him under my wing um not in a football sense, but in a sort of life sense. And um, so he said some very nice things about me, which is great. And uh, I see that he's just written his own book. So good luck with that, Glenn. And um, yeah, um, that's, that's the good thing about being at a top club because you play with top players. And I find that almost all of the top players are top people as well. And uh, that, that's also heartening to hear. 
well, t tonight we're actually going back to your game that you've chosen, Steve. The 1972 UEFA Cup semi-final first leg at White Hart Lane against AC Milan. Um, can you just tell us about that season quickly? What sort of season was it? Did you have that season? And Yeah, we finished, we finished sixth. We'd finished third the year before. We'd only added one player, Ralph Coates, from Burnley. It was a very good acquisition by Bill Nicholson. Um, unfortunately, during that year, if you check the appearance figures, people like Roger Morgan, Peter Collins and Jimmy Pierce only played less than 10 games and all finished their, their career, I think, at the end of that season. So we were depleted as such as per the normal strength of squad. Um, so we finished six, which, OK, was sort of average for Spurs, I would say. We got to the quarter-final of the FA Cup and got beat at Leeds away, which is no mean feat. Leeds ended up winning the FA Cup, I think. Um, we got to the semi-final of the League Cup and lost out to Chelsea over two legs with one of the weirdest goals you'll ever see uh, that beat us, but we got beaten. Um, having said that, Chelsea got beaten in the final by Stoke, so it's not all bad news. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> And Spoken course, like a true West Londoner. <laughs> yeah, and of course we were making our way through the rounds of the of the UEFA Cup, and uh, so we were in the UEFA Cup by beating um, Aston Villa in the League Cup final the year before. So we started to know what it was to be winners, as such, um, and. Uh, We'd had a, a very easy round against Keflavik, of course. Um, we had a war in Romania. We, we had a very difficult game in France. That was Nantes was probably the hardest game out of the lot and might have been a bit lucky to get through. Then we had a war in um, Romania. Then we got drawn again against a different Romanian team, which was not as bad. Uh, but it, it, on paper, it looks as if it was difficult, but it didn't seem it at the time. And then we get to the, the AC Milan game. And what you have to realise, again, if you look through the stats, is that we played a league game on the 1st of April, the 3rd of April. So that must have been like that Easter weekend. We lost both those games. And on the 5th of April, so that's three games in five days, we're now at home to AC Milan or no mean opponents. Mm. Italians in general then were very competitive, signed some big players from abroad, Snellinger, the, the German who obviously played against us 66 in the World Cup final. Gianni Rivera was the sort of top superstar in Italy. Um, Bonetti, I think was nicknamed the, the Englishman. Uh, Cudicini's father was in goal. So it was set up to be a big game, a big semi-final. And, and it's, it's a big game anyway, because you've got a chance of getting to a final. And every club, the supporters crave for finals. And then, of course, you need to win it once you're in the final. Um, so because of those lots of games in a short period of time, plus the injuries I'm telling you about previously with Roger, Roger Morgan, Jimmy Pierce, Peter Collins, um, we, we had too many injuries and Bill Nicholson, who'd let Alan Mullery go out on loan to Fulham, got him back. John Pratt broke his nose on the Monday game at Ipswich, uh, which sounds like an elbow, but it wasn't. It was Colin Viljean doing an overhead kick and John put his head in and got his nose broken. So Bill Nick went and got Alan Mullery back and Muller's come back into the team as captain like a raging bull and he just took the game by the scruff of the neck he ended up scoring the equaliser or the goal that put us a goal up in Milan but actually put us through the tie and scored the winning goal in the Wolves final so um, Mullers was a great re-energiser to come back in he had a lot to prove. Bill Nick was probably suggesting by putting him out on loan that he was finished. 
but a typical man of, of, of Alan's stature, when you when you when you start to knock that, you, you're going to get an answer, and it could be seen as the best bit of management in the history of football to bring Alan back. And from the moment we went, remember we'd lost the previous two games, we went a goal down in this AC Milan game. So now it's game on against tough opponents who defended for their life and it's game on. So I won't tell you the rest of it. I'll let you watch it. We'll go for it. And um, yeah, but what I will say is, but from that moment when we eventually won the game, we went unbeaten to the end of the season, nine games unbeaten, six wins, three draws. And you can tell how this game just turned our fortunes and turned the season. Because if you end up winning the European trophy, you've had a good season. Brilliant. Um, um, yeah, just be, sorry, Dermot, I was going to say, just before we put the uh, the game on, um, we weren't going to do comments from uh, uh, people in the comments section at the moment, because obviously we've got a lot of content and want to get the best out of Stephen, Steve's time for us. Um, but I'm going to make one exception with um, um, our friend Duck Jive One here, uh, because he provides so much of the footage that we use on the channel. And he's saying, um, it's Simon at Duck Jive One, he said, evening everybody. Uh, Steve has the game of his life against West Ham on the opening day of the 1970-71 season. It's in the Duck Jive One archive and will be great if you covered it. Uh, it's the Greek, Jimmy Greaves' return to White Hart Lane. Um, so obviously it sounds like there's quite a talking point there. We're actually going to do a different game this evening, Duck Jive, but um, certainly that's one we, I think we've played that one before, Dermot, haven't we? We have, um, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll certainly come back to that again. Perhaps we'll give Steve a reminder after, after the game we're going to watch about that one and we could come back to it. Or even Please talk about do. it now. For... Please do. Yeah, will do, will do. Sorry, Dermot. Shall we get the game up, lads? Let's do that. Yeah. This was, I think, originally shown on the BBC. The original commentator to the match was Barry Davis. And it was, do you know, it was the semi-final first leg of the UEFA Cup. And Steve, I just want to ask you, what was it like coming out from the bottom end of the pitch? Because now they come out with a new stand now. They come out sort of in the middle. You come out at the bottom end, didn't you, back then? Yeah, um, I don't think it made too much difference. I mean, the beauty for me was that having been an apprentice cleaning that tunnel out, where you go down and along and then up into the... You, you sort of, as an apprentice, you imagine yourself being leading the team out or being a player on that pitch. You didn't care whether you come out in the corner on the halfway line or come out the toilet door. You wanted to be on that pitch and that was your route to get there. So uh, amazing. The noise was phenomenal. I believe that that was a sellout. I'm reading that it was 40,000 people. Well, there must have been a few jibbed in because the noise that evening was phenomenal and um, just made for the great atmosphere. It wasn't the best pitch. It wasn't the best weather. It was very cold. There was a wind. I think the wind... Well, if I'm going to put myself down, I would say the wind helped my goals, but I scored one in one end and one the other. So it, it couldn't have helped both of them unless it turned at half time. But, um, but a, a, the start of a great occasion for me personally, and I never talk personally, and this is my best game, whereas I think the best game that I was involved with as a team person was at Wembley, the 81 replay victory. So... So, how, yeah. how, how difficult was it playing on the pitches? Because obviously, we, you know, you're looking at that there and it looks a tough pitch, whereas if you look at your modern day pitches now, it's like playing on carpet. Well, I, I always say that it was, we were brought up by a get on with it society. Oh. Our, our parents had been part of the war, hadn't they? And, yeah. and oh. not enough food or not food that you necessarily wanted. And, not enough feet in your house, so you had to sort of crowd around the the uh, the electric fire to get dressed in the morning. Be it bearing in mind there were three boys in our house, so you just you didn't spend time moaning about what you didn't have. You just got on with it, and we were not as much of a get on with it society as our parents were, but at least 
Bill Nicholson was that ill. Get on with it. Come on. Get your ass in gear. Let's play. Great. So all the inspiration you need, really, isn't it? What was his sort of, what was his team talk like before this game? What What did he say to you before the match or at halftime? Yeah, I can't actually um, focus particularly on this game, but it it would have been like, you know, think about what we are, think about what we've got. When you think about the power that we had in that team, uh, my kingdom. Martin Chivers with his long throws, Gilzine, Peters, yeah, there's Martin now with a long throw. So, okay, different countries play different styles and that gets us a corner. Now the corner's gonna, with the, with the power that we've got in the air, they're gonna be tested. And the reason they're gonna be tested is because the goalkeepers in on the continent in those days didn't really come out and claim things. They let you defend your man, like that fella's defending Gilly there. And they would grab you and they would hold you and they would fight with you. And they would do anything to stop you getting a free header. They may not win the header themselves, but they're going to stop you getting the header. And so Bill Nick would highlight things like what, what would send this game our way. I don't ever believe that he thought that it would be me scoring two goals from the edge of the box <laughs> that would win it. It was probably going to be a set piece or Nosey crossing with his left foot. But but actually, those things were part of the two goals. So, um, so yeah, it comes out in different fashions. But basically, you've got a competitive team. We're probably a bit tired because of the three games in five days. But... No one is going to talk about being tired on a semi-final of a UEFA Cup night against against AC Milan. You see that bit of skill, Rivera, what he did yeah. from that throw and just helped it over my head. Wow, wow, well, that's that's class. He's got class written all over him. So um, you're looking to get some sort of lead to take to Milan. We know that we've got two fullbacks that. When, when you think about wing-backs these days, oh. and therefore they're, they're sort of allowed to be a little bit weaker defensively, mm. we had two full-backs that got forward and got back, and got forward and got back. And Nolsey particularly could cross with, with great quality. And um, so we, we, we've got a force in the front, haven't we? Chivers and Gilzine. We could... We could we fancied ourselves to score against anyone, but doesn't always happen. So we relied heavily this team on Martin Chivers' goals, uh, which turned out to be the case in um, in Wolves the next game. Yeah. I mean, what was it like, like Alan Gilzine and uh, all them players? What, what were they like to play with? Did they did they help you like on the pitch and give you advice? And what was it like to play with them great players? Yeah. Um, I, in some respects, we are all made different. And some players sort of play their own game. And some players can play their own game, but be aware of other people. I was sort of one of those. I was a, I think I'd been in the team for about 18 months and never really opened my mouth off the field. On the field, I couldn't afford to be like that because that was part of my game. I, I remember training one day with a bad cold and, a, and no voice. And I couldn't run and not talk. I, 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 they, they worked together. My legs and the voice worked together. So, and I learned that lesson on that day. So people like Ralph Coates, for instance, Ralphie had to play his own game. I don't think Ralph ever gave anyone any help at any point in any game other than being part of the team. He wouldn't give you advice because he didn't know what to tell you for your position. Um, but he knew what to do in his own position. Ralphie should have got that. So, um, so Mullers, for instance, being alongside you would be cajoling you all the time and pushing you on and get closer, get closer. Now get back, Steve. Get back in. Get back in. 
so I've got to be honest, I don't see too much of that in our team now. And this is not meant to be critical of anyone, but I don't see the messages being passed from each other. And um, maybe on television, I wouldn't see that. But um, I, I like players who dictate to, to other players. And, and for me, the biggest voice, the biggest eyes and the biggest voice should be your goalkeeper when you're being attacked. He's the one that can see it from all angles and he's not yet under pressure. Watch how this goalkeeper will stay on his line. Steve, what's your, what's your thoughts on a goalkeeper being captain? Um, I don't quite understand it. Mm. But I, under, I, I think he should be captain oh. when, when the ball is in the last third of the field. He should be the leader of the voice. For instance, the goal that we're all critical of the other night with um, Tangana, I, I can't see how the goalkeeper didn't come for that. That's my opinion. So the fact that he headed it on someone at backs of head and as an own goal, um, I think maybe I'm used to Pat and Ray Clements, but they would have took that. That mm. sounds very critical, but Maybe there's reasons why he didn't do that that I won't understand from a goalkeeping point of view. But but Tangana was very clear when he headed that ball. And um, so so if the goalkeeper's captain, I would have thought he talks too much, not not enough. Okay. <clears throat> um, Is ben it... and Cooper, do you want to chip in there? Oh, uh, no, we'll just... Um, we'll just... Uh... Difficult to know what to say about the game. Sort of wait, wait, waiting for the next incident. Really, um, <laughs> did you did you feel, uh, Steve, that, that that on this particular game, were you feeling that you were up for a goal, or is it just something that happened through sheer circumstance? I think there's a it's a strong it's a strong feeling when you've got the crowd so so up for something to happen. They were on the edge of everything that night, the crowd. Okay, so the extra disappointment when you go a goal down, for sure. But when your crowd are with you, pushing you on, and you are pushing yourself on because what it means to your club and your manager, etc., and you personally, of course, never forget that, then um, this, this, is, this, this was a big moment on television, this game. So the, the, the whole country are watching this. So... You can make some sort of statement. Do you know what I mean? As per your competitiveness or your ability or your your your, your the, the difficulty to get beat, for instance. That this was my game. Get close, get close, and when it goes past you, get back. Get close. That's me going again, probably. You were like you were all over the place oh, in this game, it. and. So, what Just, a goal that was. Yeah, what that's a, a great finish was. there, isn't it? Yeah, brilliant finish. Oh, yeah. so it looks like it was all the number eights that night then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he was nicknamed the Englishman. Ah. Benetti, because they say that he tackled like an Englishman. So, he was, he was very happy to get his studs on that ball. Mm. I think in Italy, that would have been a foul. If you, if you raise your studs like that, it would have been a foul. It shouldn't have been a foul, but I think some European countries it would have been but what what a take that was to beat Pat Jennings from that distance wow you must be some player or some strike what what was Pat Jennings like as a as a player as a goalkeeper I mean to have on your side that must have been a big lift to see Pat Jennings there the big man with the big hands you know you know you've got an international legend in your to become an international legend in your goal Pat, what was that like Pat was world class Absolutely world class. If you've got Pat Jennings behind you, it gives you some type of confidence. When it has to be such a good goal that beats him, in a way, although you get a bit down off the back of the goal against you because this is Italians, this could be difficult. This uh, this could be more difficult now. Then, um, but you know that with Pat, you've always got a chance. Always got a chance. And, and Pat, Pat not only made saves, he started off attacks. And um, so he, he was a, I mean, 
if a cross went into your box, you believe that Pat was going to take it. And full fullbacks, okay, not too early, but fullbacks would got go would get going early, especially Sil Knowles, on the back of Pat's going to get that. Would would you say Pat was um very verbal? You were talking about goalkeepers should be like basically the captain when you're being attacked. Um, yeah, did you ab absolutely. Did you did you ever feel like oh well? Did you ever upset him as a team? Would he like I really have a go at the defence if you're not doing your doing your job properly? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing is that 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 um, you remember the game that Sanchez got turned inside. Was it away in Europe? Oh, M Mora. Yeah, he got fella, turned twice. Fella, didn't he? fella come inside him. Pat would never have allowed the defender to be turned inside. I mean. If you'd have got turned inside once, you wouldn't want to do it again with regard to what Pat was going to tell you. Now, that comes off the back of Bill Nicholson laying down the law that even if it, you show on the right foot, on the best foot, it still gives your goalkeeper a chance. You, you, you show them wide and trust your goalkeeper. And therefore, Pat had something to cling to when that didn't happen. Um, sometimes I wonder if the... If the direction is there, or the defenders these days, maybe by better coaching or whatever, defend different players different ways. But the problem that is that it's very important that the people behind you know which way you're going to show him. And I think the goalkeeper was surprised how that lad come in, inside Sanchez. And um, because if you come inside successfully, you've got the whole goal to aim at. Mm. How how closely would you rate Pat Jennings and Ray Clements? Because obviously you've played under two of Britain's best keepers there, haven't you? Yeah. I, I always say that I would not want to distinguish between the two of them. That sounds a bit cowardly. If you push me, I would say I put Pat fractionally in front of Ray Clements. And I think that's because I saw... I saw Pat in uh, not all. This wasn't a lesser team, but some of the teams that, that Pat had to be in goal uh, behind. Um, you know, Pat, Pat would make world class saves more regularly than than Ray. So Ray was in. Ray came in in '82 and was in a better team mm. uh, consistently over the course of time while I was there. So. I saw Ray more as an organiser than a shot stopper. Uh, I saw, I saw Pat as both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, my, my dad, my dad used to say um, Pat Jennings single-handedly was keeping us in the uh, Division One at times. It felt like, yeah, um, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah, I'd, I'd see where you're coming from then. That's that's why he'd get the edge on it because um, yeah. he had to work more. Yeah, I see what you mean. Um, we saw Dan Martin Peters. I mean. I mean, what was he like to play with? I mean, he was a great player for Hang on. West. Whoa. Oh, there it is. Oh, what a goal. Sorry, Dermot. But no, you've got to stop for that. Did you see where that started? That started with Pat throwing the ball out. Happened yeah. to be me. But... I mean, what a, what a strike. Absolutely Martin Peters perfect. was a very, very clever player. And I'd like to think I told him to, to leave that. I'm not sure that I did. But was for, that, some, was, for some reason he left it. It could have it could have been a sense. It could have been that I said my I think we called him Dolly in the day. Um there was a reason why he left it. And my point about the way Italians defend, they the goalkeeper doesn't come and take stuff. He's not like a sweeper keeper, and he's not a cross taker. So if your forwards go close to their goal, their markers go very close too. If you think about that, they play the game defensively about 10, 15 yards deeper than what a normal English team would. So actually, there has to be space somewhere. So the, the space would have been the edge of the box, which, yeah, that, that's why I scored the two goals, because their defence was so deep defending our big players. I mean, where was your favourite position? Because I know you played in midfield and then you went back into defence. 
Where did you love to play? Where was your favourite position? My favourite position was in the second division um, days, playing alongside the centre half, bringing the ball out. <laughs> Having spent years in the jungle of midfield, where space is very limited, pressure is going to come on you straight away. You get kicked in midfield like that. And um, when you play at the back and you bring the ball out, it's sort of, okay, the game is never easy. It's n never easy, but it's easier. And if, if I'm talking about the current team, if we're going to play three at the back, I want them to bring the ball out more. And I want them to release the midfield players in midfield areas. I don't want our centre-backs to be given a two-yard pass to a midfield player and we're still not further on than their attacking players. Do you see what I mean? Mm. So I think, I think the back players have to take more responsibility on the ball. Mm. Yeah, that, that which, makes a lot of sense. Which, to be fair, and, and this was with experience, this was with probably eight, nine years' experience of playing in midfield, the jungle, then I felt so comfortable bringing the ball out from the back. And, and I think, for instance, Dyer, Dyer was a, an international midfield player. I think, I think he proves every now and again what good feet he's got and what, what a good ball he can hit. I want to see him doing that rather than once a half. I want to see him doing it five times a half. I don't pass responsibility on to another centre-back who can't really do that, hasn't got the midfield experience of, of passing the ball, of, of delivering the ball. I mean, going on your point uh, about uh, lacking responsibility, do you think this current team lacks responsibility, which is why we need a current manager who needs to tell them what they need to do every two minutes? And how, how would you bring that sort of personal responsibility back into the game? Because it seems like there, there does seem to be a lack of responsibility and they all seem to be scared of uh, taking a risk. Um, yeah, I think that uh, I think that, that there's a long throw. Goal, goal mm. is not coming to punch that, He's by the way. He's absolutely rooted to the line, isn't he? He's staying on his mm. line. So that's what I'm so. saying. So all their man-to-man -man markers all go back deep. So where's the space going to be? It's going to be penalty, air, penalty box, the edge, you know, which, which, of course, someone should be picking me up on the two goals. But when, you, when your back players go so deep, there's a bigger area for them to cover. Yeah. I mean, what Martin Shivers had such a throw in him, didn't he? He really got it in there. I mean, I mean it was one of our strengths. It was, I, I, I believe that we did well in the UEFA Cup because we lost one year on away goals to Liverpool. We, we, do you know what? If we went out, we went out to a bloody good team. Yeah. But in general, even in the eighties as well, in general, we, we held our own over two legs uh, with, with, with most teams. And, um, uh, and, and part of this seventies team was the corners, the throw-ins, the free kicks, we had power, we had delivery, we had anticipation, and that, that sometimes you can have a have a bad day and get away with a, a corner kick goal, and it wins you the game. You know, I, I mentioned Nance before was was a was a struggle. Maybe it was a set piece on that day that got us through. When when your ability is actually not always going to carry you there, but your your enthusiasm, your 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 willingness to compete plus this you, you imagine you've got chivers taking six long throws a game well i tell you when you've got when you've got people to aim for like uh, gilzine england peters that's that's a formidable force it really is um i have one question i've been aching to ask you this i'm gonna ask you now and then i'll, I'll shut up for a little one let the other lads come in um what was it like to play under bill nicholson i mean it must have been a dream wasn't it bill was a very tough man he was a very fair man um uh he expected you to 
be disciplined. Um, when I say he's a tough man, he, he never actually find anyone. Um, finding would have been too easy for him. If find was... No. I had this talk with his daughter one day, and we both agreed that Bill Nick was the type of man that you, wouldn't, you didn't want to let down. That's how his daughter looked upon it, and that's how I looked upon it. You... I always talk about, say you've had a bad day personally, or maybe the team's had a bad day. You walk in that dressing room and you don't really want to meet Bill Nick's eyes. Because although he wouldn't necessarily kill you with words or whatever, but he's, his eyes sort of pierced you. And it was, it was a sort of a... You know, you know how you know how I, I say that that White Hart Lane was a working class palace. What I mean by that is, it it was not shiny, it was not fluffy, it was not luxurious. It was where you went to work. Get on with your work, do what you do, get results, and that's good enough. And and Bill Nick was very straightforward like that. He was he he told you what he wanted you to do, and guess what? If you didn't do it, you weren't picked. And you know he 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 moved Jimmy Greaves on. I don't know what was happening behind the scenes, for instance, with Jimmy Greaves, um, with regard to alcohol and stuff. Um, but I was surprised that Jimmy was was left out of the, of the team. I was surprised when Jimmy was moved on. Of course, I was delighted when you sign a quality player like, like uh, Martin Peters. But Bill Nick just wanted the best for his club. And by getting the best for his club, he did the best for his supporters. And he always, he always um, told us, he, well, he asked us one day, who, who are the most important people at this club? No one answered because they thought it was a trick question. And he said, I'll tell you who's the most important, them supporters. They will be with this club for the rest of their lives. I will go eventually. You will go eventually. They are the ones that stick with it. And especially the seasons who get older, who put their money up front and allow me to bring in new blood, new players. And um, I, I think that that's... That didn't really need explaining to us, but if it did need to revisit, Bill Nick was prepared to revisit it. And uh, it just put you in, again, where do you sit? How important are you to this club? And, and the, the way he described it, you were just the minute part of this club functioning and being, a, being an outfit and being a, a true sort of competitor in the league and the, the, the trophies that we're playing for. And, um, yeah, he, he, Bill Nick was a very simple man, actually. Very simple. His messages were very simple but consistent. And um, I, I loved playing for him. Um, he was... I think, I think you've got to be lucky in your career. At my young age, I had my brother who was leading me. Um, as a young player, getting used to the squad and, and living with these top players, I had Phil Holder as a sort of mentor, although he was my age. Uh, he, he was a sort of a mentor to me in terms of the, the combat and the, and the, the work ethic, etc., and then all of a sudden, I'm in the first team at 17, and then I've got Bill Nicholson leading my game. And um, you can't have a better leader than, than those three people I just mentioned. So, um, you know, you've got to be lucky to meet the right people along the road. And you, you mentioned Glenn Hoddle before writing my, my um, forward in the book. And I like to think that I was one of the right people that Glenn met in his development as a, as a player and as a person. I'm sure, I'm sure he'd say exactly the same. So do you think it nowadays, do you think there's just a lack of respect with your players, with your agents? Where, where, where's that gone wrong? Because by the sounds of it, when Bill Nicholson did anything, you were all there. You took, you hung on his every word. Yeah, absolutely. Well, why wouldn't you? I mean, Bill Nicholson won the double and 
that's 60 61 i i joined in 67 well this man won the double this man won the first ever european trophy for for an english team this man bought great players like dave mckay and mike england and you know they they of course they signed for the name of tottenham Hotspur, but you know, you don't sign for a big club and but don't like the manager, don't rate the manager. Of course you do. You got you got to rate both of them. If you're that good a player, you can be very choosy you sign for. So um lack of respect. I think the this is a different era, it's different times. Um I I'm guilty of making my life, my kids. Uh, lives simpler and easier than I had it, more comfortable than I had it. Not that I had, had it bad by any means, but but like I said before, you know, you there wasn't central heating, there wasn't food in the larder every time you went to the larder, etc. And you know, I see it with, with grandchildren these days. You know, the the things they get for Christmas, it's all too much, too early, and um, you know, players. Players, for instance, because of freedom of contract, players have got too strong. And I would say in this era, the clubs were too strong because of the contract situation. Then freedom of contract came and the, the pendulum swung that the, 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 the players are too strong. And then guess what? Agents get involved. And, you know, you can't always, always say that the agents are making the right decisions for the players. And... Um, and yet, you know, someone's got to lead them because it's a uh, it's a short career and you've got to get your best out of it. I think that um, I would like to... I think players these days are encouraged to be more individuals. I think that we were a group, but it was easier to be a group because we were all in the same boat. I know the top players were earning top money for the time, and the, the younger players were earning young money, but actually you sort of understood it. Um, I, I, I would have rather played in this era, trust me, and that's not me being nice or kind or whatever. Um, I think there were more men in this era, um, and I like to think I was a man in amongst my team, my club, with my teammates, and... Um, you know, a lot, a lot of football is about skill, but it's also about effort. It's about organisation, and it's about standing up and being a being a body. You got eleven against eleven. You need to be a body because if you lose against your immediate opponent, and he loses and he loses and he loses, and all of a sudden you've got seven losses, we're not going to win that game. So. Well, that must have been my night. That's, that's, that's my second shot, which weren't that far away. And that was very unusual, I have to say. I was going to say, that would have been a banger. Normally, they went over the bar like that. But um, <laughs> but that wasn't too far over the bar. But I have to say, you're man in the match so far for me. I mean, you're absolutely bossing that midfield. You were never well, Mullery there. Well, with Mullers, we were... We were uh, we were we were not going to get outrun we were not going to get out bodied um you could say you could say that maybe see look <laughs> can i just say i love this bit of footage man. this is absolutely fantastic that's did, a man there seemed man. to be many yellow cards in those days did it no, no, there, there, there was more leeway. There was yeah. more leeway, but but um, um, Mullers was a man, wasn't he? He was stand up. I'm Alan Mullery. I'm I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna stand up for myself on behalf of my club. I'm gonna stand up. And <laughs> I must admit, I love Alan Mullery here, bro. Yeah. Come on, you gotta go. You gotta get off now. Come on, <laughs> that's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. If you were that AC Milan player, you'd be absolutely raging at that point, wouldn't you? Well, they've got a very creditable one-one draw, and now life is—we we would be attacking them anyway if they had eleven men. But now they've got ten men, 
it could be the one spot where I picked the ball up to score the winning goal that was missing. Do you know what I mean? So this this comes into an era that I love talking about of game management, time wasting, falling over, etc. And I I don't like it. I absolutely don't like it. I know it's a modern word in the modern game, game management, but no one ever puts the case that game management doesn't always work. And um, I think it needs to be shown more that it doesn't always work. It's it's sort of given as a, a it's a given that wasting time and putting a sub on um, waste time and it's acceptable. No, it's not. No, it's not. Too, too many too many coaches, my opinion, are very good at teaching you how not to play, and not very good at telling you how to play. Mm. And I and I think that's a worry. It, it is. I mean, um, Ben, do you want to ask do you want to chip in here, Kev? We're well, just referring to that point. Is how do we? How does football change from this? Because I, I totally agree with you that football is it's not it's no longer a game for the gentlemen. It's sort of how you, how you can win by cheating your opposition, but not doing it. How can we bring this sort of fairness back into the game? Is it something you do? via FIFA or UEFA, or is it just a, a respect level in terms of players to players, colleague to colleague? Well, I suppose it's more difficult. I've got to be careful here with Aussie listening, maybe. Um, <laughs> there was obviously a change in emphasis with foreigners coming into the game. Um, all nationalities played different. Um I, I would say that the referees have got to start refereeing. If a ball goes out 10 yards from the corner flag and the defending fullback is going to take that throw in and steals 10 yards, you don't allow it. You do not allow it. I've seen that happen within the first minute of a game and they let the fella go on and on and on and on and on. And normally the home crowd argue about it, but nothing's done. There's the start of players not having enough respect for referees. And most of the time, referees bring it on themselves. So I don't think anyone understands the VAR bit these days. I mean, do you celebrate? Don't you celebrate? Mm. Problem. Someone in the end has to make a decision, and I don't see the decisions being any better from an office than they are on the pitch themselves. Bearing in mind that you're going to have human error. Mm. I think we have to take human error, but we don't accept it when it's on a VAR camera. Because it shouldn't be that, that way, should it? The, the game where Harry Kane was given offside. Well... No, and then a, few, not a, got, a few days later, you got a slightly different decision with somebody else. And it, I, mm. I guess one of the massive biggest frustrations is it's slightly inconsistent because you've got humans analysing the data. Yeah, it's there's a human decision somewhere along the line. And I, I'm not convinced that the percentage of getting the, the decisions are that good with the, with the technical abilities that they, we've got. Oh, there we go. Would, There's your second one. Sorry, I Steve. would like. I would like to say that I chose that corner, but I didn't. <laughs> I chose to get a good strike on the ball and try and keep it down if you possibly can. So take the ball out the air, cushion it, toe down. If it goes to the other post, for instance, that's cleared. So I would like to tell you, I aim for the right hand post. No, I'm, your... st I'm still going to pretend you meant that all the way. Well, no, you meant that. <laughs> but but I'm, you'd shoot a goal to score. If you don't buy a raffle ticket, you're not going to win the raffle. Absolutely. So, so you, you want a good strike. And I, I think the wind was against us there. So anyway, the noise created with them goals, you haven't got the noise on, of course, rightly so. But the noise created with those two goals was absolutely phenomenal. 
it really was like the glory glory nights wasn't it at then at that time the Tottenham wasn't it in the six early 60s and early 70s in Europe it was well, I, just well, well I'm convinced that that was sold out I'm convinced of it and sold out was I think 52,000 wasn't it and back in, well, back in the day then yeah so you're not standing and people were I saying think they did pack 40, a few 000. more in there I think a few got him for free that night. I think. So, so do I look at look at his look. There's a throw in that Nosey has not have to touch to the halfway line. Yeah. You think sometimes how long the ball takes to get to the halfway line these days from a from a goalkeeper? Mm. I mean, I haven't even seen that style of play from a keeper. I mean, we had Herelio Gomez a few years ago, uh, 2007 to what is it, 2008 to uh, 2010. I mean, yeah. it's sort of that that style of goalkeeping is a dying art, and it's a real shame because it's like you can the goalkeeper is part of the team as well, and to see them absolutely own, uh, to st start being the one to stop the attack, but also start another attack. Uh, exactly that, right, exactly right. Yeah. Pat Jennings, Pat Jennings was an excellent goalkeeper. I mean, world class. Hundred was it? Hundred and fifteen caps. Yeah, I was going to say, he, played, he must have played in the World Cup 40, 14 years after this. He was still yeah. going in Mexico. Exactly right. <sighs> you know, just as a bit of extra uh, info for you, about six or seven of this AC Milan team won the European Cup in the late 60s. It was well, when wow. the era when teams didn't change so much. Look at this long throw. I mean, that is such a weapon to have, isn't it? Rarely there when you're attacking, they rarely threat. I mean, Martin Shibbles was a great striker anyway. Sc scored some brilliant goals for us, but what a weapon to have. That 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 is give there a free kick rather than a penalty. Watch. Watch. <laughs> well, you, that's the one point where you look. You would hope, and I'm going to say hope, that VAR might... Oh, no, he hasn't. He's got, why is it? Hang on, sorry. Why is he giving a free kick? Is that yeah. like an indirect free indirect kick? Indirect free kick, yeah. So what, we're saying he didn't mean to foul him? <laughs> um, just a quick up. The referee was from Spain in this game. Yes. Um, he was on the FIFA registered for six years. Um, yeah. But he was a Spanish referee. Sorry, I forgot yeah. to mention that at the start. He, he's funny. I do laugh at this. <laughs> I've watched this. He's so funny, this referee. <laughs> Brilliant. Great for us. I mean, this style of referee needs to come back. I mean, you were alluding to it earlier. Uh, referees then were respected. Uh, and now you, you've got we've got referees. That al they're almost like they want to take the focus of the game off the game and onto themselves. Like the saying, Absol uh, abso I agree with that entirely. Game. I absolutely agree with you. It's, we, we, I mean, I, I've been out of the game for a couple of years now, but I heard, or, or with part of a rule, where you could only have the, the, the captain go to the referee to appeal something. These days, these days, there's about six around the referee. And no one does anything about it. What, what, we, I think we've got to look at rugby in terms of the, the respect that the referee gets. I was just going to say to you about that. I, I do watch a bit of the rugby, and I tell you what, you've got these... Tiny little referees, these big, hulky, great guys that go up to them. And as you were saying earlier, it's the utmost respect. If the referee Absolutely. says something, that's the end of it. And they call, they call them all their first names. They'll be like, you know, if they were talking to you, they'd be like, Steve, I've made my decision. Walk away. There's and no think, arguing. They go. And I think they have to explain to the crowd the decision, don't they? Mm. I think there's yeah. an element of that about it, which... OK, if it, if it goes against your team, you're probably not going to be happy. But you know what? They all get on with it. They're, yeah. they're still a get on with it sort of uh, era. And we've gone gone past it, haven't we? What, what, yeah. about, when, what about when people get a, a red card or give a penalty away and it's obvious that it's the right decision? They argue for about five minutes. You, but is that? Do you reckon that's part of the game management of like you know if you're stood there waiting to take a penalty and you know I'm arguing for five minutes it unnerves you? Appeal, appeal everything, argue nothing. Nothing wrong with that. Appeal everything. Ball goes between two of us and we both get a foot on it. 
and it goes out of play, of course you want it. Yes. Don't go for you. Get back to where you should be. I, um, I, go on, sorry, Jim. Steve. Jim is on. Sorry. Jim, your neighbour's yeah. on. Yeah. Probably for Ralph. Oh, Ooh. come on. Um, was that Eddie Bailey that on the on the sideline when they made the substitution? That was Johnny Wallace. Oh, Johnny Wallace. That's Johnny Wallace name. led me as an apprentice. He was uh, manager of the A team, so we had five teams in that that time. First team reserves, A team, under 18s, under 17s. So um, Johnny was like did lots of different jobs. He was a player to start with. I think he was at Tottenham for over 50 years, John. Nice man, very committed Tottenham person. And one of Bill Nick's sort of, he knew that, that Johnny was, was made of the right stuff, whether it be talking to me as a 15 year old and leading me or, you know, giving an opinion on a player to Bill. Cause you know, Bill was never going to, um, couldn't see every game, so we had to take people's opinions as well. So, well, and there we go. That, that's the game. We won two one. Um, we got a uh, we won in. We got result in Milan, and we went on to win this competition this year. Our first win in the UEFA Cup against Wolves. Um, those those from that game onwards mm -hmm. to victory against Wolves and unbeaten in nine was a victory for Alan Mullery in terms of his power to come back in and lead. He didn't come back with a long face and mope about because he had been upset. He got on with a job and finished his career at Tottenham the best way possible, which is picking that cup up and running around White Hart Lane and being put on people's shoulders. That That is a man. I mean... We had so many great players then. I mean, all of us, me, Phil, Coover, uh, and Ben, I mean, we've got and it's, such a rich history as a club. And, it, and, and it's how and you great fit. History. It's how you fit together. You're all different characters. You know, Chivers is different to Gilly. Different. Yeah. Gilly was better in the air than Chiv. Chiv was going to be sharper and, and drive with a ball. Think of that first goal at uh, Wolverhampton, for instance. Uh, the power that uh, one was a header, one was a shot. The power that he had in his in his feet was amazing. Gilly was clever. Gilly was very clever in his little touch headers. And Jimmy Greaves would say he was the best partner he ever had. And um, but to 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 marry those two together and me with Mullery, and you might say, well, there's not enough sort of. Um, what do we say these days that we're missing Ericsson because there's no way to put that ball through there or through there. Well, you know, I scored two in that game. Muller scored one in the second leg and Muller scored one in the final. <laughs> so from midfield, two sort of workers, runners, tacklers, whatever, scored four goals that must have helped us win the trophy. Oh, absolutely. Cool. Phil, <laughs> Oh, hang on there, mate. You've just gone on. You've muted yourself. Muted. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Um, I know we've written down some questions ourselves. We will be getting the comment, some questions from the comments. But, Phil, do we want to ask the questions that you, you wrote down earlier yourself? And okay. Then, and then ask you your right. Question, this is a big, wide-open question. But if you take player for player in their positions, who was the greatest player that you ever played with at Tottenham? <sighs> That's Sorry. Such a, that, well, okay. It, it's such a it's such a difficult question because it's like when I put Pat slightly in front of Ray. It's just slightly, but you know, if I'd have played those years with Ray at Liverpool, that might not be the case. Do you know what I mean? So, so if you can have to distinguish between two great players in their position, um, I would say Pat was the better shot stopper. Uh, Ray was slightly in front on the organisation of it as such. But remember, I, ca I came across Ray when, when he was probably in his 30s. Mm. So he'd worked his game out. I'd probably come across Pat when I'm 15 and Pat's 22, 23. So you haven't quite worked your game out then, have you? So, yeah. 
So, um, but how can you judge a Pat Jennings, for instance, against a Jimmy Greaves? I suppose the only way is who, who, who gained you the most points. But, you know, you could also have a, a, a Mullery who didn't always score the goals I've just mentioned, but would be putting someone out of the game as such, you know. Um, deadening their sort of power, the opponent. So, although it isn't obviously a, a point winner, it could be part of it. So, I, I really don't want to answer that. I would say the player I had most joy playing with was Glenn Hoddle. And he's an inch in front of Ozzy Ardiles. And that's no disrespect to Mullers or... or Martin Peters or Mickey Hazard or whoever. Um, I, I I probably, because Glenn was homegrown, I sort of invested a bit into him. And I think he, he looked at me as someone to sort of follow because he wanted to be a homegrown Tottenham boy. He loved Tottenham. And, yeah. of course, he had to leave in the end. Of, you know, it's probably obvious. Well, no one has to leave, but it, it was his, his desire to, to go and pursue his, you know, further his career. So um, I think I got more joy out of what Glenn became. I didn't have that same effect on Ozzy. Ozzy was a player when he came to us. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. I, I enjoyed Ozzy. I loved him. I roomed with him. I, I, I learned so much from Ozzy. And um, just, just that bit of being ingrained Tottenham I and and I'm a true believer in homegrown players I I think we you know you, you I don't like mentioning these names but say for instance John Terry or or um or the Arsenal captain um Adams Tony Adams yeah Adams yeah. you know they're homegrown and they're leaders mm. maybe it takes that bit of extra to I, I believe they understood the mood mood of the crowd. So if we come off at half time and the crowd weren't happy, I would let the team know that the crowd weren't happy. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. you you're actually playing the game together. We're playing, they're supporting it. We win or lose together, of course we do. So um I mean Harry Kane, homegrown. If, any, if anyone can tell me that when they saw Harry Kane the first 10 games, they knew that he was going to be the player that he turned into, I call you a liar because he, he didn't look like it at all. I think if you give homegrown players a bit longer, don't expect it too quick. I think there'll be more good results at the end of it than bad ones. And, um, and like everything, it's, it's the mixture. Take a, our 80s team. Robertson Miller from non-league, from non-league. Yeah. Two World Cup winners. Okay, one genuine World Cup winner and Ricky. <laughs> okay, okay. That, that's, that's not disrespect, but he didn't win the World Cup really, did he? And and yet he won the, the, the 81 Cup final for us. Um, Archibald and Crooks bought in for money. Quick, quick. I have a joke and say you, you weren't so quick to the bar, but anyway, that's another matter. <laughs> um, but but Paul Miller and Chrissy Hewton, homegrown, homegrown, and people say to me, "Yeah, we we could have got a more stylish player than Paul Miller." Well, do you know what? Paul Miller put his body and his balls in the way of the shots, and if you get a more clever player and a more artistic player, maybe he wouldn't have done. So it's the, it's the way you balance all these things up. And um, I, I wasn't, David Pleat came in. I wasn't surprised at all when he replaced Paul Miller and, and uh, Graham Roberts. I wasn't surprised at all because in David's world, he would have believed that they gave away too many free kicks. Yeah, but if you don't replace their heart and their bodies, you could easily get two players that are quicker. You could easily get a player quicker than me. But when the ball was involved, I, I was quicker to the ball than people think because the ball was like a magnet to me. Do you see what I mean? So, yeah, it, 
lots lot, lots of good players and it but it's it's how you fit them together and how you work them bill nick bill nick never praised us bill nick if you if you bill nick didn't speak to you you played well <laughs> right that was that i'm telling you and eddie bailey you know how eddie bailey told me before i ever played a reserve game i finished the game at uh, against at Chesham. A team, Metropolitan League, on a sort of uh, coming into the summer time, May, early May. So we played late afternoon because you didn't need lights. And coming off the pitch, we probably used to win by three or four. And it said, Perryman, yeah, come here. What, Ed? Someone tells me there's a list up in that dressing room. And it's the possible list that are going to America to tour with the first team. And apparently, your name is on that list. How did that happen? Did you write your name on that list? No. These days, that would be, Steve, you're having a good season. Bill wants to take with the first team. Get yourself ready to go. They could not say, well done. They just could not say it. So... Now you've probably got, you know, too too many well dones, and, and I don't like coaches that say well done too many times. I, I can't have it. But um, remember the era that I've come through and what they've come through as well. But um, as we say, different eras, and they've got to cope with today's sort of pressures, and we had to cope with our pressures. And um, I. The one good thing is I say about my era is that no one was earning 100 grand a week more than me. <laughs> Can you imagine earning 60 grand a week and then you hear the top player is on 160 grand a week? Mm. Well, you've, you've currently got the captain at, at Spurs, who's I think if you look, if you believe the media report, he's the fifth highest earner of the club. Ah, okay. Well. Someone's made that decision, and they'll they'll live and die on those decisions, won't they? But um, but yeah, I mean, I don't begrudge any of them anything. Would I rather the chairman or the owners have the money or the players? The players every time, every time. Um, I've got a I've got a quick question from uh, one of our uh, one of the people in the comments, uh, Ryan McFarland. He's asking on behalf of his father. Um, what was the best Spurs team that you played with? That's a tricky question for you, I'll bet. I think, I think that's decided by this game, although I scored two goals, that wasn't a regular event. So I was sort of being pulled along by that team. I got in at 17. This was probably when I was 21. Um, but I was a, I was a, I'd make, I'd make them a self-selectable by being consistent, by being trustworthy. If the manager picked me, he could trust what I would give him in terms of effort. Um, when I was in the 80s team, so it was between the 70s and the 80s, the early 80s team, I was a, a major player in terms of the manager would have spoke to me two hours every Sunday after a game about what I thought, what I didn't think. What, what we can improve, et cetera, et cetera. So, okay, I wasn't the manager. Of course I wasn't. The, the manager's got his responsibility, but he he would he would take me in as like a lieutenant with regard to selection and tactics and all that stuff. So I was a force in that team. I was being forced in the 70s team. So I got more enjoyment out the out the 80s team. And... One of my biggest regrets is that neither of those two teams could win the league, and that's what our supporters deserve. And um, we were we were an inch away from being consistent enough, but we were never quite that. Hmm. I mean, that's a great answer to, to Ryan. Um, I've got one question, and then we think we'll go to the chat then, guys, I think, get some of the questions from there. Um, I've heard this story before. I watched you on the documentary on Sky when you did one with Glenn and Ozzy. Um, I think it was Time of Our Lives. Yep, yep. A few years ago. Yes. 
But um, I love the story. How did you find out about Ozzy and Ricky were joining? And I love the story, then. I'd love you just to tell us how you found out. Well, when you consider what me and Keith Birkinshaw went through, so he gets made manager. Um, I'm captain of the team at that time because Terry Neal made me captain. Bill Nicholson actually made me captain, but by giving me the, the vice captain uh, role. So because he saw me as a captain down the down the line. Um Terry Neal, when he let various players go, um Martin Peters was let go, therefore I was still there, so he made me captain. Um so bearing in mind what we, we went through a relegation, we went through a promotion, we went through heartache, we went through joy, we went through the lot, and we were intertwined in terms of I knew how he was going to work. He knew how I was going to work. And we're both serious football people. And, and it says a lot about Keith that I did not know one word about us signing our dealers. Or Via. I mean, I probably didn't know the name of Via. But I certainly, by watching the World Cup, knew the name of our dealers. And maybe Keith went out there and didn't know that he was going to sign our dealers. So he wasn't going to phone me transatlantic to tell me or ask me, what do you think about us signing little fella our dealers? I know what I'd have said, rip his arm off, have him. But um, I found out by walking down the stairs one day in half a sort of sleepy state in the summer months, uh, probably not even started pre-season yet, and uh, picked the paper up. Spurs scooped the world seeing that we'd signed Ardidas and Villa from Argentina. Wow. Wow. And then from the moment I read that, the phone didn't stop ringing. You can imagine. Mm. For, my, for my comments, be it from friends or papers or whoever. So, um, yeah. But no one really believed that I didn't know. Yeah, I heard that before, and I, I found it a brilliant story, and I just want you to share it with them because it's absolutely... Sure, sure, sure. Even Glenn didn't know, because Glenn Hodder was doing his contract with Keith at the time, apparently. And even, yep. Keith, even Glenn didn't know. <laughs> so I, I think probably that Keith didn't know when he when he flew out there that, that it was anywhere near being able to be said to someone else. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it would be do, like yeah. a, a sort of a, not a promise, but a a statement that could have gone wrong. So, so well done him for keeping his mouth shut. Yeah. <laughs> I do like that. Ozzy said, can I bring my friend along with me? I mean, yeah, what, yeah, what? yeah. Well, I know all about that because Ozzy, yeah. Ozzy in the first few six months of doing whatever, he, he used to come to me as captain to ask me about things and, uh, or help him with things. And he bought me this letter and it was for a local school to where Ozzy lived and, Chesham, for instance. Dibby, I do this. And it's asking him to come and present the prizes at the school assembly. I said, Ozzy, you should do that. Yeah, you should do it. You do it, I do it. Yeah, but I live there away. Okay, I don't do it. <laughs> so... So I got sucked in all sorts of things because of Ozzy needing someone with him. And, and I relate that back to him saying to Keith, bring my mate. <laughs> so, yeah. Absolute brilliant story. Phil, you've got a couple of questions from the chat, haven't you? you okay, yeah, that's all right, in? Steve. Yeah. Yep. Trying to pick out some themes here, but the first one is from Simon Yap. Which of the six trophies you won at Spurs meant the most to you? So the um, the eighty one replay Man City Ricky goal um, simply because when I joined Tottenham they were a top club signed big players top manager etc. So actually, although I was surprised to get in at seventeen and then won a couple of trophies early, two League Cups and a UEFA Cup, it was sort of expected, sort of. Um, of course, then it wasn't expected that we, we dipped to the, the depths that we did and, and got relegated. But, but by the time we come back and 
so I, I say this all the time. You've not you've not made your comeback until you win something. So that win against Man City put us back on the big stage. And the the confidence boost you get by winning your first trophy, it's almost like you've gained respect. We didn't have respect when we went down, but now all of a sudden we got back up, so we're sort of levels, but we're not quite good enough yet. And then Keith puts together this team, and we go to Man City, and we could have easily lost, you know that, from the first game. We could have easily lost it, but we won it. And we won it in good style, especially Rick, the quality of Ricky's goal. And um, that was us back on the stage. And that was the point where Tottenham had got back to where they were when I joined them. I joined them in 67 when they won the FA Cup against Chelsea. I signed after that game. So it was ironic that, you know, you, 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 you're, you're sort of judging your own career by you getting in, getting a signing an apprentice, then signing pro, then getting in the first team, then making appearances, and then people talking good of you, then playing for England under-23s, etc. And then the dip comes. And eventually you go so low that you, you start to rise again. I suppose it's like the circle turning. And it was official that we were back that night at Wembley and we repaid the supporters for all the grief that they'd had for the previous number of years and um if you started supporting spurs when they won the double and then when they won the european cup winners cup and then when they won the fa cup you would have been extra disappointed with how it went most of the time after that on that day i knew that this club had a chance with a group of players that we had with a manager that had been they kept faith in him and we're starting to build, and we were growing up from behind. The, the youth team were doing great things. The, the the players coming through, the Mickey Hazards and all that stuff. Uh, Ian Crook was a good player. Gary Brook. Um, of course, we had Miller, Hewton in the team. Um, I knew that it, we were we were gaining momentum in all sorts of ways, and and we did we did carry on that momentum. Um, why did it stop? Well. I think the club got in some sort of financial difficulties. I don't like what, what Scholar did to the club. Um, and I haven't liked a lot of what's happened since. But so by, by a mile, a young 19-year-old Perryman would love to go up and get the League Cup. Not as a captain, but get your trophy, your tankard. Of course, I love being part of the UEFA Cup. But when we won the FA Cup, it was like, although I'm a team person, I treated it as if it was vindication of me staying at Tottenham and helping the club through the crisis that it had been in. And therefore, it gained more more uh, kudos than, than just winning another trophy. Wow. Okay. There, is, there is a follow-up question to that, actually. <laughs> actually one Sorry, we're El is it Ellie's question? <laughs> Got to do yes, this. It is. It is. It is. Um, uh, Ellie is asking, uh, Steve, when you lifted the FA Cup in 1981, a guy jumped down and hugged you. Has that guy ever got in touch with you? Yeah, unfortunately, he's dead now. Um, oh, no. I met him at a, we had a 25 year get together um, dinner. Uh, Chaz and Dave appeared, and, and uh, everyone showed up. And uh, a wonderful night. And this chap come and introduced himself to me. And uh, so it was good to see him, good to meet him. Um, I'd have preferred if he didn't do it, to be honest, because it must have been so dangerous what he did. You jump about six rows of, of seats to just land it like he did. I don't know if he was a gymnast or what. <laughs> but he landed it and just enjoy hug me so i understand what he was doing and the fact that that question is being asked this many years later it proved that he made some sort of impression didn't he and uh well done him i'd have preferred if he didn't do it actually but uh that was his way of showing his passion and he probably did the jump you know like when 
I, I can't understand why players that go on their knees after they score a goal, how they don't injure themselves. And it must be the adrenaline you get when you score a goal, that it's almost like nothing can hurt you. Or if you did a jump after you scored a goal, you'd jump higher than you've ever jumped in your life because of the, the elation of what you've just done. Well, imagine his elation at us winning the cup for all the reasons I just spoke about. He had power in his legs to jump that distance that he jumped and not injure himself. <laughs> if he'd if have fell awkward on a step, by Christ, he'd have been in hospital forever. But anyway, well done him. Do you, do you remember if he said anything to you at the time, or was it just too noisy to hear? Yeah, just too noisy. Yeah, he probably was saying, yes, 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 <laughs> as we all were. Of course. All right. Um, right we're gonna I do... think there was one st – sorry, for there was one story. Did Ozzy dent the cup? Is that actually a true story, or is that a bit of folklore? You all get in the bath after at Wembley. In those days, you were allowed to bath together, and um, – I think the first bit is when you're in the dressing room, there's a champagne in the cup and all that. It gets passed around and and all that. Ozzy was a particular type of character. And, yeah, it, 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 very, very funny guy and and uh, shows his emotions and shows his joy. He can't hide it. And um, I've got a funny story about him getting kicked in a game. But I, I think he, what he did is he tossed the cup up in the air and the, the, the top of the cup just got hit on the side of the bath. So, of course, it had to be repaired and, and all that goes with it. But I'm not sure if that came out quite at the time. Maybe it was it was, um, it was was knocked back, but I, th I think it did happen, yeah. But my funny story about Ozzy is that we're playing away at uh, Everton and people wanted to get Ozzy. And because uh, they felt if they if they stopped Ozzy and kicked him that that we were a lesser team, uh, but of course they had the same feeling about Glenn. But um, this particular day, a very big, awkward-looking centre forward from Yugoslavia or somewhere did Ozzy from behind, and really did him bad. And Ozzy goes down, and when he gets up, Ozzy, he's screaming for some reason at the referee, not the player. You, you effing this and that and whatever. So he's obviously thought the referees allowed this player to get away with it too often or this team against us too often. And I run over as captain, not wanting him to get sent off. So I'm saying, Ozzy, 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 steady, Ozzy. And he puts his head down the side of mine and he said, I'm as cold as fucking ice. <laughs> <sighs> ah, okay. Anyway, so it all finishes and we get a free kick and take the free kick and whatever. And as he runs past the referee and says to him, bloody foreigners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Go on, Phil. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there for like... no, I'm just, I'm just obviously conscious of time because obviously we're at seven o'clock. Yeah, so, I don't know whether you, whether you got time for another couple of questions or whether couple they... of questions and then we'll yeah. go. That's it. All right, Perfect. I'm going to do this Perfect. one. And... I've really enjoyed this, by the way. Thank you very much. No, thank you, Steve. It's oh, been a pleasure. Our pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Right, this one, I'm afraid. Please, can I ask Mr. Perryman why does he feel he never got more senior caps for England? And that's from from Moon Dog. I think that um, I think my real purple patch came when we were in the second division and after by that time i think it was decided that i was a jack of all trades master of none with regard to the international sort of selection um because i was prepared to change position i could play center midfield defensive i could play right back i could play alongside the center half um and therefore, I wasn't seen as a specialist. And therefore, to get picked for your national team, you, you probably need to be a specialist. Um, I, I was consistent. I was loyal. Um, 
And I don't think that I think those things would turn you on if you're a Spurs supporter. They wouldn't necessarily turn you on if you are got the whole country to pick from. And therefore, I don't think I was ever seen as good enough. It didn't cause me any sleep this night. So I had so much joy and pride playing for, for Tottenham that actually when there was an international week, I was I was happy for the rest. And um, I saw it as my sort of role to sort of lead the band who weren't playing for Wales or Scotland or Ireland or wherever. There was a little group of us and, and we had a bit of fun that week and we enjoyed ourselves and we worked on individual skills or whatever, of course, led by the manager. Um, so I, it wasn't something that worried me. I, I sometimes look back and think, was I... Um, was I pushing myself enough to be thought of as an England player, English player? And, and I also think that I, I got a record number of under-23 caps under Alf Ramsey. Alf Ramsey was a particular style, and he picked... If you tell me that the 11 that won the World Cup were the best 11 players in England... I would definitely have an argument with you because they were not. Well, Jimmy Greaves wasn't there, was he? <laughs> Absolutely. So, But it was a way that they linked together and made a team. And you couldn't argue with that. Jimmy Greaves, for instance, couldn't argue with that because we won the World Cup. So, so I think if you want to pick the best 11 players, I was definitely not in it. <laughs> I was definitely not in that. If you want to pick a team that can play together, so if, for instance, Glenn Oddle was the number one choice on the team sheet, I think someone might have thought of me as a good ally to Glenn, to give him the ball, to know how he, what he reacts to and stuff like that. Glenn actually wasn't rated like that, was he? I don't think Glenn played enough, uh, enough international caps for for his ability as such. So I always think that Glenn was picked um, uh, despite despite his ability rather than because of it. And I think he, he only got in when there was a public clamour for him to play. So he was almost picked backhandedly. Mm. And therefore, I, I think some England managers actually wanted him to foul. They got forced into picking him and then they were he was happy they they were happy if he sort of didn't quite do it i think he did do it on a number of occasions but i think that um glenn being in the national team on a regular basis would have helped me but um i definitely have not ever lost sleep over it without a doubt never did does that mean that i didn't want it enough probably but but yeah I, why, why would I want someone to pick me if they don't want to pick me? Can't change their mind. Mm. That, Robbie, Robson, so Robbie Robson called me the baby-faced assassin. And I think that tells you everything. I don't think he liked me. And I don't, I don't normally like players saying, oh, I'm not picked because the manager don't like me. That's, that's not where I'm coming from. But... But uh, I think he thought that I was responsible for any bad feeling between Ipswich and Tottenham. And I don't know that I was. I was a competitor. I, For instance, I'm not saying that, that, that um, Conte is not a winner. Of course, he's looking like he is a winner. And he's proven that he's a winner. I personally could not have shaken that player's hand when he came off the pitch. The player had come off injured. Do you know what I mean? My my setup was: if you don't play for my team, I don't want you. And actually, if you don't want to pick me for your team, I don't want you either. So that's how it was. Um, brilliantly put. Um, Kuva or Ben, would you like to any questions you two like to ask? Yeah. Ben, do you, would you like to go first? It's it's a bit more of a general question in terms of what does Tottenham mean. As for the, the younger fans, such as me, that have grown up in the, the years of somewhat mediocrity, we've not seen the, the glory years. We've learned from, my, for me, it's from my uncle, from my grandfather, from my father. What does Tottenham mean to this younger generation of English people 
who how do we stick with it in terms of a football club because there isn't a lot to believe in most of you support the club because of some family link uh where does that link start could have started back in the 50s and now it's grandchildren and etc if you were 10 years old and you're at the first game or one of the early games you watched was the 81 replay final i don't care if you're in norway sweden wherever watching it you're probably going to be a spurs supporter do you know what i mean something is the hook <sighs> I'm yours. I'm Spurs. Um, the lot of the people driving this is your family, older family, and they have got this image of this club, Tottenham Hotspur, and that name will never change. They're never going to call it Tottenham Albion. Um, but it's almost an old-fashioned image. It's the image of Bill Nick and honesty and loyalty and and all of that stuff and you know in that era that management led to victories and cups and glory and with bill nicholson bill nicholson for instance got promoted out of the second division and won the first division the next year he managed the double team he managed the first english team to win a european trophy i mean the the the, the plaudits are unbelievable. And, you know, you, you, look at, you look at Bill Nicholson and you want to trust him. You want to follow him. And, and that's this image that, that a lot of the older supporters have got. And they, they don't want to tell their son or their grandson to go and support someone else, do they? they? They're still loyal to it. And, you know, that's why I was so disappointed that, that the team Poch didn't win the European Cup. Still the European Cup as far as I'm concerned. But um, because it would have given the young supporters a reason to extra support their club. And um, so I sometimes wonder about that. I Basically, you've got to decide, do you trust what's going on there or not? Hmm. And if you don't trust it, how can you change it or how are you going to leave leave it alone and go somewhere else because that's even more difficult okay imagine that's... imagine you get introduced of he supported spurs till he was 40 years old then he said fuck him i'm, I'm going to go and support someone else yeah, i don't think just... i don't think you'd be looked upon in a good way <laughs> from <laughs> so the people that's hearing man. that story so you got a you got a pray that is being done right behind the scenes, and you're going to make your own judgments on that. And um, I I'm still supporting the, the the Tottenham Hotspur that signed me as a 15 year old. I've still got my heart in that, and um, I want that to be respected by this club. Um, I don't I think if you don't respect the past, you haven't got a future. That's my opinion, and. Um, People say to me, why are you not ambassador for the club? And I say, because I get the feeling, no one's actually said it to me, but I get the feeling that if you're an ambassador, you lose your opinion. You can't say it how it is. And therefore, I don't want to be in that position. I want to be free. I want to have a free opinion. And I want to tell it how it is. And I'll tell you how I'd like it to be. Um without sort of being encumbered by, oh, well, you can't say that, you shouldn't say that, that's disloyal, whatever. No, I don't want to kill the club by any means. Absolutely not. It means too much to me. But um, at times, I, I would like them to do it in a different way. Mm, okay. And then we're going to do our very last question of the night to the man in the bottom there, to Mr. Coover. Oh, we, we're going to do the, the traditional question then. The, the, yeah, we have to. I might even have to apologise in advance for this one, but this is um this sums up our channel. It's the question that everybody needs to know: Who is hotter, Wilma Flintstone or Betty Rubble? Oh. 
That's some real consideration there. I think I think the, the what I look at for as the younger one of the two, Barney Rubble's wife looks younger. Betty, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> legend, club legend. And is she dark hair? Is she dark hair? Stephen Cooper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good um, question, I just want to. Sorry, Steve. Sorry, Steve. I interrupt you. Good question. I just Thanks. want to put this quote out before I let Phil end the show. It's something I found Bill Nick said, and listening to Steve tonight, I think it's worth saying. And I, I'll read it out. Um, it's something Bill Nick said. He said, It's better to fail aiming high than succeed aiming low. We of Spurs have set, our san have set our sights very high. So high, in fact, that even failure will have it have in it all the echo of glory. And I think this is what this club should, the path of this club should remain. Bill Nick is a big name. He's the godfather. He's the father of Tottenham Hotspur. And he should never be forgotten. Yeah, I think the other person, not to detract from anything you just said, the other person that needs remembering is Eddie Bailey. Yeah. Eddie Bailey, alongside Bill Nick, was a small man, but he was a giant in his sort of opinion and his purpose and his drive. Um, and even in those days, that job of managing the club was a two-man job. And Keith had um, Peter Shreve with him, both people I very much respect. And... Um, uh so I, I just want to give a little shout out there for Eddie and um and yet you could have a laugh with Eddie. Um I, did, did, none of you saw Eddie play, did you? No. A great was was one. Eddie part of the fifty one team? Yes, push and run. Yeah. Eddie Eddie was the star player in terms of the one touch and move. And um and my mate Phil Holder. Um, we used to have a laugh with Eddie. Eddie was a Londoner and London humour and whatever. And uh, one day he criticised Phil over something. And Phil said, my dad used to watch you play, Ed. Oh, yeah, older. What did he say? He said you couldn't tackle a good Sunday dinner. <laughs> 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 what a quote what a quote but that was that i mean that sounds a bit uh disrespectful and it wasn't meant to be but it was a a humor and you were in it together and you were fighting for each other and you know you can't go you can't go away to milan in front of sixty four thousand people and be shrinking violets You've got to stand up for yourself and be a man against the man you're playing against. And um, you can't just switch that on and off. Oh, I like that manager. I don't like this one. You've got to get on with it and go for it and go for it. And um, I, I want to see a bit more going for it, personally. And, um, you know, I, I like Conte. I like what he stands for. And I like what he says, and um, I'm sort of, I'm sort of getting to like him more and more. I, I never disliked him. Um, this is not a two-minute job. Mm -hmm. the, the 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 quality of the squad was, for whatever reason, was not right. And that performance we saw in the first half against Chelsea was there under the previous manager. It was there for Mourinho, and it was there at the end of Poch. The consistency of all that is the players. So, as he said, it's more than bringing in new players. I understand that as well. He's got a lot of work to do, and he'll find out so much about... He would have found out things about the players who played in the first half, and then off instruction, played like they did in the second half, which was an improvement. The ones who were missed, like Dyer, out of the team. You know, you think a certain thing about him and then he don't play. Oh, do we know why he didn't play? 
Uh, I think the the whist, the the rumor is potentially COVID. Okay, he and was one of the one of the. And you wouldn't want to announce that because if he comes back in the team, then someone might think, well, we can play on him because he's whatever. So um, so yeah, but um, uh, yeah. All right. It's a great okay. club. It's a great great club. The the greatest thing about the club is the history and the tradition and the supporters yeah and a, a lot Don't of us now doing things like like this because we want to relive or yeah. you know we we yeah. want to make sure everyone remembers the good old days but we also want you know for the new generations to have them for now yeah, you can't you can't live in the past that's for sure i suppose that's what we're all trying to do but um we basically want that club to keep pushing forward Absolutely. And uh, yeah, so I've really enjoyed this, chaps. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, Steve, it's been it's been an absolute honour and a and a pleasure to have you on. And you know, we we've nearly quadrupled our standard night of visit of <laughs> you know people that watch us. Um, I would just like to you know just announce we are um, dedicating this show to Dermot's father, Jimmy. Uh, it would have been his 75th birthday today and no longer oh, with us, it. but was a, a big, proud Tottenham fan. So we're going to dedicate the show to him. And if he knew you were on, that would have that would have done everything for him. But from all of us, Steve, I it's sure. been an absolute honour, an absolute pleasure. And I'm so pleased to have met you, to speak to you. But more importantly, the fact that you led our club for so long is just is phenomenal. Would, would you like to give one quick last plug for your book, Steve? Yeah, A Spur Forever. Um, I guarantee you, you'll enjoy it. Um, available through the publishers um, or uh, steveperrymanpublic at gmail.com. Um, I've also do, I think, a decent podcast. Uh, it's not in this style, I have to say, but um, we... We give our opinions and we, we have a bit of fun, of course. So um, be nice to hear you and um, and see you. And good luck to you all. Up the Spurs. Come on, you Spurs. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Thank we'll you see you again soon. See you. Bye-bye.